urban, suburban, rural, and remote, opioid addiction and death from overdose have hit crisis levels and penetrated every part of this province. Let's get the wide-angle view from different parts of Ontario. And for that, we welcome, from our studio at Confederation College in Thunder Bay, Ontario, John Thompson, who heads our Northwestern Ontario hub. From our studio at Western University in London, Ontario, Mary Baxter, who heads our Southwestern Ontario hub. And here in studio, Jayan Jagannathan, our Ontario Hubs field producer. Hubsters, it's good to have you on the program again this week. Let us, uh, Jan, I want to start with you because you did a field piece on this. Mm -hmm. We want to tease that a little bit and then we'll come back and chat. Sheldon, if you would. It's not in the papers as much in this town. Oh, you know it's there, you hear it. But Sudbury's the kind of place where they're not going to have it, they're not going to talk about it. 2,458 people died from opioid overdoses last year, and the numbers continue to climb. Our outreach staff have seen over the course of the summer at least one death per week. TVO travels to Sudbury and Hamilton to see how frontline workers there are fighting a seemingly losing battle. At this point, it's got sort of a life of its own, and, it, and uh, it's frightening to think of where that might end up. Jan, more than 2,000 deaths across the country. You went to Hamilton, you went to Sudbury. What did you find? It's bad. Uh, in Hamilton, just to give you an idea, since January, Hamilton paramedics responded to 307 calls related to opioid overdoses. Hmm. In Hamilton 2016, 52 people died. So let's, if we compare that to Sudbury, a smaller city, about half the population, we had about 17 deaths, which doesn't sound like a big number when you compare it to 52, but I was talking to harm reduction workers there and they told me this summer was particularly bad. The months of June, July, and August, they were reporting about a death a week. So when you look at those numbers, pretty bad. How do those two cities stack up compared to the rest of the province? When you look provincially, those two cities are above the provincial uh, rate when you look at the death rate. Uh, Hamilton is particularly bad. The average is 48% higher than the provincial average. That works out to be about nine people per 100,000 that actually die from an overdose. Do they know why? They don't, and that's, you know, talking to harm reduction workers, they collect the information, they're out there on the streets talking to these people, but that's one of the things they're still trying to figure out is exactly what's happening, why. One of the reasons we're glad to have these Ontario hubs is that uh, there are stories that take place all over Ontario, and we can check in to the various regions and see how it, uh, essentially happens on the ground in those places. So Mary, let's go to southwestern Ontario. Uh, as you looked into this story, where did you go? Well, Steve, there's been a lot of uh, uh, writing done, or research done, about uh, the opioid crisis in urban centres. So I thought I would take a look at a more rural area and decided on Huron County and also Godrich. Huron County is uh, actually quite large. It's north of London. It's on uh, Lake Huron. And it's probably about the uh, half the size of the GTA. So it really is quite large in area. But it has a really small population. It's, uh, I think, uh, 60,000 uh, people live in that area. And in Godrich, it's only a community of less than 8,000 people. And what did you find? Well, I found that uh, there's definitely concern about uh, op opioid use, uh, particularly uh, the, the more traditional kind that we've seen in uh, over the, the past number of years in terms of pills, uh, and worries about more potent forms of the, the drug coming into the county. But there's also a lot of concern about uh, more traditional drugs, such as alcohol and uh, methamphetamine, which is also known as crystal meth. Hmm. Let's go up to northwestern Ontario and John tell us where you chose to focus your lens as you looked into this whole issue. Well the northwest has really been uh, in crisis over opiates for a decade now so it's difficult to, to condense that into one story. Um, some figures that can help uh, in Thunder Bay 30 percent of babies born in the hospital uh, the mother had some exposure to opiates over pregnancy uh, out to Kenora to the west 
Uh, they hand their Morning Star Center hands out 455,000 needles a year in a town of 15,000 people. So that's how it's going in the cities. Uh, in remote communities, uh, First Nations, uh, some cases we're seeing 70 to 80 percent of the adult population uh, that is affected by opiate use. So when you look at the opiate crisis in northwestern Ontario, you have to look at it in terms of entire system pressure. Did you visit one First Nation in particular? Well, we look at a few. Uh, one of them is uh, Yabmatung First Nation uh, in the Matau area, known better in the south as the Ring of Fire. Um, in 2010, they declared a state of emergency, and uh, today the, the Chief Elizabeth Adlukin is saying that uh, they are coming out of it because only one in two adults are, uh, are experiencing opiate addiction. Only 50%. It's true. Hmm. And in, uh, in other communities, we're seeing similar figures. So you, it, to me, it's, it's miraculous that you could have a community in which four out of five adults are addicted to a debilitating drug and the place could still be standing. So in the case of the communities in the Ring of Fire, you're looking at the complexity of negotiating the biggest resource deal in the history of Ontario as the backdrop for, uh, uh, for that situation. I talked to one nurse who said that she has seen a community in which only eight adults were sober. Hmm. Mary, uh, you pointed out at the beginning of your first answer that um what is available in urban versus rural Ontario, the nature of the problem, all of that would be different. So if this is an issue in Godridge and if people need services, what kind of services can they tap into? Well, people in Godridge are actually fairly service rich in comparison with the rest of the county. They've got a hospital there. The hospital has emergency services. It also has a psychiatric unit. Uh, there's a needle exchange program that happens in Godridge a couple of nights a week. Uh, the Canadian Mental Health Association has an office there and there's lots of access to counselors. There's even a pharmacy that has naloxone, which is, uh, as, as, as you may well know, it's the uh, uh, antidote to uh, uh, overdoses, opioid overdoses. Uh, but, you know, if, if somebody wants treatment, like let's say they want to go on to a methadone program, they would actually have to travel about half an hour south to uh, a, a town called Seaforth to attend a clinic there and get their prescription. And then after that, if they're living in Godrich, perhaps they'll be able to uh, get that prescription filled at a pharmacy there, but not all pharmacies in Huron County will fill methadone pre prescriptions. So people may have to go to even yet another community in order to get their prescription filled. That is the challenge of uh, rural Ontario and what's available. Jane, let's come back to the cities. Uh, again, you were in Hamilton. You talked to frontline workers involved in this. Biggest challenges they're dealing with now or what? I don't, I don't even think you can you can say just Hamilton. If we talk to any municipality in Ontario, funding is one of the biggest challenges. There's just not enough money, not enough naloxone kits being handed out. You know, the province is spending millions of dollars to treat um, kind of the complications of opioids, trying to treat that, but they're not dealing with the underlying issues. And that's what I've spoken with when I've spoken with the frontline workers there. They tell me, you know, naloxone's great. In Hamilton alone, 290 people were revived this year. That's 290 mm -hmm. lives, but it is a Band-Aid solution. We are not talking about it. And when I ask them, what, what can we do? We don't have answers yet. They're okay. still working on what exactly can we don't do. don't have answers, but you said that there are underlying causes here that need to be <laughs> dealt with. What are they? It's, it's a lot of, you know, a lot of abusers. When we were out in Hamilton as well, it was uh, people, one of the biggest issues is you can get fentanyl over the counter. You can get it from, you know, overseas. It's getting into drugs that normally people are using, like heroin has, has made a comeback. Let's go up to northwestern Ontario. John, if you're in a situation where in some communities in your part of the province, literally half the people are dealing with this issue, how do authorities there even begin to wean people off of the drugs they're hooked on? Well, again, half the people is deemed to be a success. Half the people is deemed to be coming out of it. 
so um, there have been some successes with naloxone, a brand called Suboxone, uh, because it doesn't require as much medical oversight uh, to administer. Uh, th those are happening in a number of communities throughout the north, and there has been some success in migrating users off of the street drugs, the pharmaceutical drugs, to the drug substitutes. The challenge comes in where you're migrating people off of the drug substitutes to complete sobriety. And the issue there that I'm hearing from across the entire region and up to the highest levels in system integration is that you can't fund the front end, that is to say the care, without funding the back end, that is to say the aftercare, mm -hmm. when you have a situation where there's widespread trauma in this population and the speed at which the street drugs change and evolve um, is faster than they can commit to. And some of these people are gonna need help uh, uh, counseling, housing, those sorts of solutions for the rest of their lives. So Ontario is committing a, a $222 million and about 2.7% of that is going to go to uh, Northwestern Ontario in dealing with that aftercare. Um, I can tell you one thing, Steve, this isn't gonna be the last time we talk about this. No, indeed, but uh, there was an announcement made by the, I think both the federal and provincial governments this past week in terms of more money for enhanced broadband in Northern Ontario. And that may seem sort of off the path from the discussion we're, we're having, but I gather it's not. How, how could that be helpful? Well, telemedicine is something that is being used uh, on a widespread basis here uh, because the populations are so sparse uh, and small. And so they're being used to, uh, in some cases, uh, talk to family members who are living in long-term care. Uh, in the instances uh, in Fort Hope and Yabatung that I was just talking about, um, the, there's a potential to have psychiatry and other uh, medical specialist care and counseling and long-term care uh, committed through broadband. Now that project isn't expected to be finished for uh, a number of years, uh, so there's, it's not going to help right away, uh, but I think where it has been applied, we've seen some successes. And so there's some promise that uh, that, that community in particular feels. Back to Mary in southwestern Ontario, you know, the, the place that you looked at, Godridge, I mean, they've got this reputation as quote unquote, the prettiest town in Canada, uh, you know, right on the beautiful shores of Lake Huron, the most glorious sunsets anywhere. Um, you know, how do the stereotypes affecting uh, Godrich's reputation uh, affect its ability to handle this problem? Well, you know, often when we think of uh, drug addiction, and, and particularly when we're thinking of something where it's injections or something like that, there's a picture of that people might get in their heads of people congregating, for instance, in parks. You know, I think of uh, the, the classic film Panic in Needle Park, for instance. But I, we have also seen that kind of coverage in Vancouver. You know, there's just great hordes of people that occupy certain parts of the city and, and they're dealing with this. In a rural area, though, uh, addiction is, is really hidden. Uh, because if you get those kinds of congregations in, in a public area, police are going to come. They're going to, to split it up. People have to go other places. And the other thing about that perception, which is true in uh, rural areas as well, is that uh, people are often who struggle with addictions, they're homeless. So, and, and that's also the case in, in Huron County. I, but the way that it shows up, and also in Godrich, and the way that it shows up is that people are couch surfing. So again, they're not particularly visible. And it's really hard to treat what's not visible a couple of minutes left here. Let me get into two more issues. Uh, Jan, we saw again in Sudbury in your teaser off the top we showed. Uh, there was a quote from somebody who said, Sudbury's the kind of place where you're not going to talk about this. W what did you take from that? You know, it's not necessarily uh, denial there in the city. It's people just don't know how much this is affecting areas. We're, we're hearing today, you know, this is affecting every corner of the province, whether you look at major cities like Toronto, Hamilton, midside cities like Sudbury, cottage country, small towns, this is practically affecting everywhere. I think a lot of places have been just dealing with it themselves, and a lot of coordination is starting to happen. We had the task force on October 4th announced, so I think the discussion's happening. It's a little late in the game, and we're kind of playing catch-up, but it's, it's practically 
on every corner. And John, let's finish up with you. We don't want to leave everybody with the impression that it's completely hopeless out there. Bearskin Lake First Nation, you took a look at that. Some seeds of hope there? Uh, yes, um, the, there's a counselor named Gary Kamido uh and he was, uh, he was an addict, he was a construction worker. Um, and, uh, and he submitted himself to the Morningstar Center in Kenora uh, back in 2011 when they were just doing straight withdrawal. And so uh, that was, he said, the most difficult time of his life. When he went back to his home community in Bearskin Lake, he found that he had no job, that his drug addiction was uh, widespread uh, and very public in his community, and he felt as though he was on the verge of starting to deal again to be able to survive with his family. Um, and so, and that would have brought him back to using as well. So what he did was um, he started working out um, and in a program that the police put together for weightlifting um, and he ran for band counselor and won. And today he is going to the Suboxone Clinic and he's handing out the drugs to uh, the people who are coming into that program. And. I mean, the, he, he sees that as an opportunity uh, to prove to the people in his community that you can turn your life around. And for some people, it's working. And on that encouraging note, Mr. Director, can we get a three shot of our hubsters? As we say thank you to John Thompson in Thunder Bay, Mary Baxter in London, and Jay and Jagannathan, who's always in a van going somewhere, this time Sudbury and Hamilton. Thanks, you guys. Until next time. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.